Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode six of Sinking with Service Now. I'm your host, Andy Whiteside. I've got Eric Schwartz on me. Eric, how's it going? Very good, Andy. Thanks for having me. Appreciate the time. Looking forward today's to today's conversation. Yeah, I um, we were just chit chatting about uh, life and how busy summer is. And summer's supposed to be the time you slow down, but if you've got a family, uh, it's kind of the time you you speed up and work abnormally. Now, what is abnormal? after the last 18 months. Yeah. You know, I think it's, uh, it's about, a, it's you, you work in a more, in a more compressed manner to take advantage of the weather or of other people's availability or whatever it is. So, mm-hmm. you know, it seems like it's a little crazier, but it's, it's still that yin and yang where it's, at more intense, but it's also more leisurely, right? So they're constantly pulling at each other, at least hopefully if you're doing it right, I think yeah. uh, that's how it is. So, well, that's going to, you know, kind of tie into what we're talking about here is, you know, going back to work, even though one that the, the new work is going to be different from the old work uh, and it will in some degree never be the same. Yeah, this is true. This is a hot topic. Uh, you know, getting back to the office, how that how that happens, how what if it's going to happen. Um, I know personally, and speaking with some of my friends that are in other industries, uh, the the outlook on what they're doing and how they're handling it is very different. And there have been some big time CEOs of some large institutions that have publicly claimed to the media that they are bringing people back in different ways than a lot of other companies are. So I think that there's going to be a, in in my complete personal opinion over the next year, there's going to be a reckoning period, if you will, of, uh, of businesses coping with the reality that things can be very different than they were and it doesn't need to be a crisis to force it that way. And, and that is going to impact a lot of people and businesses. So it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out in my opinion. You know, it's going to be interesting to watch the, um, the way companies handle it and the way they market, how they're handling it in ways that tries to give them the competitive edge. Is it, is it we're all going to be back in the office and, and working together as a team again? Is it all going to be like a hybrid type thing? And it, it's really the watching the way companies are positioning themselves as a differentiator. Um, or maybe they're just doing it because they know they can't afford not to play along with how um, you know workers are demanding that they work going forward. I, you know, I work for a small business. I, I can control I can say what I really think and do what we really want. Uh, and it probably has a, a lower impact on us. I'm, I'm all about getting back in the office and back to working together again. And uh, while, you know, knowing that from day one of establishing our company, it's always been very much a um, flexible uh, and, and resilient. And we're going to talk about resiliency here, but it, it's very much been about letting technology and work um, blend in with your lifestyle while getting the work done. We didn't have a change a whole lot when this all went down. We just kept doing what we were already doing. Um, and I think that was natural. And, and I've got, this isn't because, you know, we're smart business leaders. It's because our company was birthed at a time when, when cloud computing and a flexible uh, work-life balance was normal. I don't have the rigidness of paying for a $20,000 a month office that people have to come into so that I feel like I'm getting my, my, my rent money worth. Yeah. Yeah. I hear that. I hear that. And that's great that you guys were, are able to do that and have kind of had the tools and capability of when you started to kind of build that naturally. I think a lot of other companies are going to struggle with that. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think I said this in the, in the last, call or the last podcast recording where we were talking about the human element and how that's so important. And I, I greatly agree with that. I feel, uh, withdrawn and disconnected from, uh, from that. And I'm looking forward to changing it. And, uh, I think the other piece 
though, is that flexibility, that work-life balance. How do you manage all those things together? And um, it, it will be interesting to see how that all plays out. And I, I think, you know, shameless plug, you know, I think ServiceNow can provide a gateway to that, but ultimately the business and the leaders at the business need to determine what's most important for them and how they're going to implement change, if at all. And then look, nature is going to take its course. People are going to decide what they're going to decide. And ultimately, that's what's going to dictate what happens, regardless of what any business does, right? Like the people will, if they have an opportunity to do something different and they want it, do it different and they will. Well, let's, so I want to get back to what you said about service now playing a role, because I do think that's important. I do think that SaaS types of new world technologies is actually helping people see the force for the trees and what they should be doing. Uh, but I, I did want to comment something that you just brought up, and that is, you know, an employee has always wanted to do something. They've always wanted to live in Hawaii. They've always wanted to live on a mountaintop in Washington state. And so they took the opportunity of the pandemic to go do that. Now, does the company need to find ways to solve the fact that their employee is no longer on the same time zone as them uh, and use technology to solve that challenge? Or does the company have the right to say, look, you, you took that a little too far. Uh, we're, we're a New York based business. You now live in Park City, Utah, which nothing would make me happier than to go have a place in Park City and a place in Charleston, South Carolina and go back and forth between the two. But it's just not reality. It, it's like having kids that, you know, I can't just pick them up every six months and move them to a new school. Right. It's my responsibility as a parent and as a worker not to take that gap and try to ex exploit it for my, own, for my own use. Right, that's true. And, and I think the, there's a fine line between having... Uh, responsible talent produce for an organization and what the parameters of what that person could be doing is, right? So um, it depends upon the role and their contributions and, and what they're doing. But ultimately, I do think that there are limits on what, what you can expect, what an employee can expect an employer to enable them to do, right? So uh, it's very possible that you could live in a completely different time zone and no one would ever know, right? You, you're completely remote. You can work whatever set of hours that you want to work or whatever and be connected to all the systems and uh, software and, and communication mechanisms to, to collaborate. But there's still going to be a, a piece where you have to collaborate with other people, right? And so there you... You have to find that the, if you were drawing those circle diagrams, like where that overlap is and what level of effort and cost it's going to take to make that the optimal time period, right? And, and how much work can you get done with that at the right cost level, right? So it, it, you, you pull that string in two directions. You have an office that, like you said, it's like $20,000 a month or whatever it may be, and you need to justify it. Well, you go too far in the other direction and you're spending uh, exuberant amounts of money on travel or shipping or, uh, infrastructure, like software technology infrastructure to just enable the disparity of people. Well, you know, that's not, that's not really any better. Right. Uh, so managing all of that to get people to produce, finding that balance of where somebody can produce the best work, be enjoying it and also live their best life while managing the business and keeping the business health healthy, like that, that's super critical. And, uh, that's what, that's what this next 12 to 18 months is going to be all about, in my opinion. And I think we're fortunate in the United States to be in a really good position from a pandemic pandemic perspective. And I think in a lot of ways, the organizations in our country are going to be setting the precedence, uh, going forward. Cause there are some other countries that are not in the same position as us and they will, will hopefully be, and then they'll hopefully take our lead. Yeah. Well, and, and we've been getting ready for this for a long time. Uh, that, that, I want to tie this now back to the article, yeah, the definitely. blog that we're going to review. And, and here's what I mean. Um, can you imagine getting through what we just went through and how we're going to react coming out of it without the power of the cloud, 
without the power of SaaS applications. If we were still all 100% stuck on client server applications and VPNs as our only way out, as our only way to consume the company's technology, can you imagine how limited um, our flexibility would have been during and after the pandemic? Yeah, well, so let's talk about that for a second. So first, uh, I call back to an article that I read a couple months into the pandemic where the writer was talking about what would this happen if this was 10, 15, 20 years ago. And you know, now was the best time to have this type of situation happen, right? And so let's talk about like the, the infrastructure, right? Just as a, an extreme comparison, just imagine that if everyone that went into the office used a computer that was not connected to the internet to do work in something like uh, Microsoft Office, right? That was not what, what it is today, right? Like, mm-hmm. and the, all the work that you did was there. It was contained in your, your computer and you left and you had nothing, no way to connect to it, no way to collaborate, share it or any of that, right? right. So then you have this work that people are doing and they are the work that they're doing is attached to business processes. And this is where you start tying this into what ServiceNow is doing. And, you know, ServiceNow is not just software. It's, it's all about the business. And so the business processes that you would have from one person to the next, that alone is so manual and w- where you literally have to take something and extract it from the computer or at least the, the software that you're using to get it to somebody else to do something. So fast forward to now with ServiceNow where, uh, you know, we have a product called business continuity management, which is all about managing resiliency in an organization. Uh, you, you have to build that platform, that protocol to, to have it. So when somebody is logging into work, that work can transcend wherever they are, whatever they're doing. And then from a visibility perspective and a leadership perspective, you're able to look into your business and see what services are critical, what processes are critical and what are, is not critical is just as important. And then knowing how to prioritize all the available resources that you do have and tools that you do have into getting work done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think a lot of those same principles apply to the, the, your personal. I'm not sure if we talked about in this podcast or a different one, but, you know, imagine the imagine what happened without streaming media and, and high speed Internet access. And, um, you know, what, what would what would you have done when you weren't working during the pandemic? Yeah, just imagine that. Uh... Uh, and I just saw this speaking of all of this, it's somewhat meta. Uh, there was a, there's a Netflix uh, documentary, which I have not watched yet. It's about the last blockbuster. And it's like, just imagine if at the beginning of the pandemic, there was no Netflix, there was no streaming media and everyone had to go to a blockbuster to watch a movie. And uh, you know, what would that happen when, when the world shuts down and you're left with the cable, you know, (laughs) what would happen? I think people would have lost their minds and we're so fortunate to be in the situation that we're in. So, um, but, you know, to, to bring it back to, uh, uh, to the blog post that we're talking about uh, titled return to the workplace, four steps to ensure business resilience. Um, you know, this talks about a little bit about what we at ServiceNow have been doing, um, and a little bit about what we can do. Uh, so, it, there's hey, Eric, space. Yeah, go ahead. Eric, can, can I interrupt you real, real quick? Yeah, Something please. you hit on a minute ago, which is important for this blog. In theory, the business is supposed to drive the technology that supports the business. That's in theory how it's supposed to work. And it does in a lot of cases. But what I really love about what ServiceNow is doing is the technology is driving business thought process. For example, um, you, know, you got this concept of ITIL in your IT service management world. You, you don't necessarily have to go out and learn ITIL and apply ServiceNow to it, because if you just implement ServiceNow, most of the structure of the software is going to drive ITIL type of process and business thinking. That's my favorite thing about ServiceNow is that it gives you a framework while providing the tools 
to manage and, and maintain and get to where you're trying to get to using that software framework. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's right. And, and that's, we're able to provide that layer of abstraction from understanding the raw nuts and bolts and allowing you to combine both business practice and protocol with the tools necessary to apply them to your business together, right? So you're able to buy that car that's going to get you from A to B and combined in that is the raw technology, the infrastructure and everything. And all you have to do is get in and drive. And if you want to customize it to be really specific to what you want to do, you can do that too. And so I think that's a good analogy to explain what we're doing here, right? So you can um, take service now and apply it to your business, like you just mentioned, utilize out of the box capability and immediately gain value without needing to have a whole research arm on figuring out, well, how do we apply the basic principles of ITIL or how do we provide the basic principles of, you know, business resilience and um, um, high availability to our infrastructure and business practices? And how do we get all these things to talk to each other, right? That, that also, even if you had an expert in IT and an expert in some other area of your organization, uh, you still need to collaborate together, which creates a whole nother layer, right? Sir, mm -hmm. That's what ServiceNow is doing. We're, we're giving you the tools and the platform to be able to build that collaboration between organizations and then at any moment in time view into what's going on without needing to have a meeting of the minds, kind of calling back to our last conversation where we were talking about dashboards and bringing the data to what's important to the right people. Right. Well, I, I love your analogy, your example real quick, and then we'll move on. There will come a time, if not already, that you won't actually have to learn how to drive, like drive a car. So car is about your ability to instruct it on what to do physically every step of the way and, and actually do it historically. But now if you can just program the interface, that's, you know, this interface that's there for you, if you can just plug in the information, in theory, with all the sensors and the radars and the mapping, and you literally will be able to get to a point someday where you can get somewhere in a car that you're controlling without knowing how to drive. Absolutely. And it, funny enough, uh, I've already been having some of those conversations uh, with some family and friends. A, a friend or a family member of mine was talking about a friend of mine's electric vehicle uh, that has a substantial amount of automation capability in it. And they were showing it off and they were like, oh, I'm never going to get one of those things. I want to stick to driving myself. I don't trust it, blah, 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 blah. Totally valid argument. But I said, you know what? I said, how's that horse of yours? And mm -hmm. they're like, what do you mean? Well, guess what? People probably said, that they, they don't want to ever have a machine take them anywhere because they wanted to trust their animal and their horse and take care of it and all that stuff. And it's the same exact argument. And uh, eventually, exactly what you said is going to happen, right? And some people now ride horses for leisure as opposed to like a required form of transportation. And people will drive for leisure as opposed to it you know, being driven. And, uh, you know, I see take, that happening. Take that argument full circle. I guarantee you when you go on a trail riding a horse these days and that horse walks that trail every day, you don't actually have to drive the horse. It knows right. how to get you where you're going. Right. Yeah, that's right. And it's got intelligence, not a, not a massive amount, but it's got intelligence. And, and to, it, to really twist the circle around, uh, you can make the argument that the intelligence that we are building into uh, technologies like ServiceNow about how to run your business are now able to do things for you too, right? Where we can actually apply uh, machine learning uh, to the activities of an organization to help you be proactive and, uh, uh, and not reactive to have some things happen for you where you don't need to spend the thought on dealing with issues or recovering from problems or calling on information, right? That the AI and automation, which is what ServiceNow is all about, is able to take, take the reins. And uh, the more that happens, the more people will trust it. And the more that uh, you'll be able to continue to elevate what it is that you're doing to focus on different things that are more important. Right.
Okay, so one other piece of this, and then we'll jump in here, but it all comes with consequences, right? We, we've got to depend on GPS, we've got to depend on, um, you know, error, error corrected, not error proof, but error corrected software. I'll, I'll use this example, we talk about horses and cars and um, what's the number one problem that faced every major city in the country in 1910? uh the i i don't know i don't know that horse manure okay they didn't they couldn't get it out of the city fast enough there was too many oh. horses the automobile the automobile saved america's cities because it solved the horse manure problem true story look it up wow okay oh i believe it that's pretty crazy and it just goes to show you right the the usage of a new solution can have unintended consequences that you wouldn't have never assumed that you would have solved it in that manner. Yeah. Which but, kind of goes back to what you were just saying about how previously it was about gaining the knowledge and understanding to then find the tools and solutions for it. Whereas now it's a little bit different, right? And you can now apply change based on the solutions that are available to you, right? And it's, it's changing that way of thinking. Uh, and some, sometimes I've called upon this, I think in a previous episode, I talked about the Truman Show. And I constantly talk about this when it comes to technology and how it can impact our lives and businesses that you become complacent with what you've done up to this point. So just like that, the manure problem, right? Why would you ever solve it with a machine that would replace a horse? We have to find a way to automate the manure removal system or something. You know, I mean, I don't know if that's what they were thinking, but that's how I would think about it today, potentially, if you weren't thinking about totally changing the game. And a lot of people are reserved about that way of thinking, but it's becoming easier and easier to do that. And uh, I think that's what, what we're all about, too, is it's... We're about changing the organization and not not just give you a crazy tool that you don't understand how it works. The, the current evolution and how you change the organization, either whether it's culture or what have you, uh, from a technology perspective is um, SaaS based applications that can evolve as fast as you need them to in an iterative type of manner. Um, and that's that's what ServiceNow is compared to the legacy client server tools. Um, that had a use case and that use case was there for three to five years while a new version of the product was coming out. Now you can be very, very quick with uh, time to market on, on solving more problems quicker. Right. And, and having a uh, service now be SaaS connected, it just, or be a SaaS product for, for example, you know, it's, it's like I said before, it's about connecting the people and getting the work together, right? So the um, if you go back to my example before where I was talking about having people log into their word processing and whatnot in the office, just imagine that there was a patch or an update that in this critical time, you were able to apply it and then all of a sudden have all these systems be interconnected to each other, right? And it was, it was that easy but you still had to go and manually apply it everywhere, right? That is exactly what you just said, right? The, that lift is so unbelievable that it would just basically not happen in that, in that instance, right? But we're, we're not there anymore. We, you build that, that digitization of your organization today, and then the software and solutions that you have in place will provide you with the agility to change even when you're still changing. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's also very important and something that you probably wouldn't really think about, right? Because you're thinking about the thing that's right ahead of you. I need to solve this immediate problem. But having the reliance on cloud infrastructure and technology, whether it's ServiceNow or core infrastructure or whatever it may be, it provides you that flexibility and agility that you just would not have if you're relying completely on solutions that are on premise, right? And they still have a place and they still do things that um, are valuable to organizations and people, but uh, having that connectiveness and the, is, is, uh, is there, you can't really put a cost on it. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the best tool we have today. And someday there'll be better tools, but it's hard to imagine there being a better way to manage and handle this. Let's, let's talk about bullet number one, which is uh, build a culture of resilience 
how is ServiceNow doing that in its product and in its um, in its business itself? Yeah, so it, it, talking about uh, people for one, right? Uh, th- which goes back to our first episode where we were talking about. Uh, I think it was our first episode where we were talking about human human centric design, right? So when you're talking about resiliency in your organization, your uh, initial thought is to talk about people and the places where they work and how they collaborate and, and do their work. Um, but it's it's more than that. Uh, you need to make sure that everyone within your organization understands what those product protocols are when you have to deal with a crisis. And it doesn't need to be a global pandemic. It just be an office closure or an, a major outage of, of some of your infrastructure, right? Uh, anything, it could be a highway closure and people can't get to the office, so whatever it may be, right? You need to make sure that the resiliency that you have is built into the natural culture of your organization. So everyone understands the protocols of where I am, what I can do, how I do my work, and what happens in plan A and plan B, right? And you can take the view of, we have this diagram here in the blog post, so I uh, recommend anyone who's interested to go check it out, but it's distributed work plus digital workflows equals increased resilience. And, And basically what that means is that you have all the people that are doing work wherever they are. You have the digital workflows that connect the work that they are doing, regardless of what system of record it is that they are using it, whether it's Microsoft Office or uh, uh, Salesforce, whatever it may be, SAP, and then the work that they're doing to collaborate, how they're getting work from one person to the other. And those two things combined enables a fundamental basis of increased resiliency, right? Because you, you immediately are what you know you you're already living in the boat when uh the icebergs melt right so you like everything's ready to go when the icebergs melt you're just going to float and you're all good and that's basically what those two things come together i was going to call out to water world and kevin costner but i don't know if all the listeners would know that reference <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not sure even people that were uh, old enough would remember that one um <laughs> That was like his first big bust, but it was still a pretty good movie. It just yeah. wasn't, uh, it wasn't, you know, Dances with Wolves or whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, and living on the boat, we already have all your stuff there, everything you need. It's proven that you can survive on the boat. And when the flood hits, you just close the hatch and off you go. Right. Um, I, I do want to highlight something here, which is your, um, which the text as well as the picture brings to the forefront. Uh, we've been talking a lot about SaaS. I think the real key term going forward, though, is is really what you have here, which is digital workspace, digital workflows. Um, SaaS is just an enabler of the the modern day digital workspace, which is this online collaborative real time tool um, versus us just calling it SaaS because SaaS is SaaS is almost legacy at this point. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, ServiceNow, we talk about how we are the platform of platforms. Uh, We routinely talk about that. And that's really what it is. We are a business platform. I like to say sometimes that we are a uh, business operating system. And it's what the digital workflows between your businesses do. It's that is what we are. And so it's not just software as a service it's it's platform and it's business as a platform not not tools and applications and systems Mm -hmm. of record it's it's getting that action taken care of with the platform that you have the connecting everything right well i'll go back to my comment earlier though it's it's a platform for you um that lets you do what you need to do but also kind of gives you points you in a couple directions and if that's not your direction then you can evolve the platform to to, to your needs um but again i till as an example right if i just if i just follow the software and what it asks me for and do the things it asks then i'm following i till standards whether i realize it or not right yep absolutely so the next uh, call out here is number two. It says increased program visibility. I think this has a lot to do with uh, what you're talking about a while ago, that everybody can see real time where what's going on in a platform like this. Do you want to talk through it? Yeah. So obviously, uh, when you have a fallback plan, if no one knows that it happens, then 
uh, it's working. Um, but it's more than that, right? Because when you go into that extra mode of operation where it's not everything as usual, you still need to be able to peer into your business and keep tabs on what's happening so you can quote unquote, fail back to the original way of doing things or fail forward uh, is probably not the right term, uh, but move into that mode of, of operation, right? And so uh, having the appropriate visibility between all of the appropriate people is very important. And we were just talking last week about how dashboards in service now can provide that level of visibility without calling upon uh, particular people to draw up a report or pull data or analyze information, right? You want to have this information at your fingertips. And it's true that the ability to respond to a crisis is as good as the data that you have to make those decisions. And so uh, in this example, our business continuity management application enables a leader to have the access from a high level business perspective about the current state of affairs in your different groups and within your organizations, what the business impact is, uh, your, your uh, continuity plan, whether or not it's in place and what stage you're at and um, the impact, or excuse me, the uh, retime, the, excuse me, the recovery point objectives and how you would recover and where you're at in the process. And then of course, you know, further steps in identifying uh, gaps or um, um, other support areas that maybe aren't, that aren't accounted for, excuse me, Siri is talking to me. Um, so so yes, that's what it's about. So that's number two, that gives them visibility where they can come look. Number three is where you're reaching out and telling them proactively what you specifically need them to know that you're maybe not, uh, maybe maybe you can't just assume they're looking for. Correct, right? You wanna be proactive about, and and when, when you are proactively sharing this information and making sure that everyone's plugged in, it, you can be overloaded with information in a crisis, especially, right? What's important, what's not important, who's supposed to do what and where. And, and having all of that already taken care of, again, allows you to make decisions quickly and easily and making that data available anywhere. Like, for example, you know, we have a mobile app and you're able to access your information and your uh, business continuity management dashboard from anywhere. And so if you're not in the office or the proverbial office, as it may be referred to going forward. Uh, you have the ability to see that data and make decisions and everyone can do it, not just the one person with access to it, right? You, you can proactively reach out. You want to make sure that everyone is involved, everyone is informed, not just you or your employees, but your customers, your vendors, your partners, anyone and everyone that is part of it, because the more informed they are and the more proactively informed they are, the more productive things are going to be and uh, the more trust that there is going to be uh, across the board. And um, that's how things get done properly is, is with real trust. This, this blog, right? If I could go back and write it for me, I would actually have this one being number two, which is I get that real time stuff coming at me, which unfortunately ends up being noise. Yeah. Uh, and then number three for me would be my ability to have in my head uh, my ability to go look at what I am looking for. That's, how, that's, that's unfortunately how my world is. I, I don't, I'm not, I just, real-time notifications, I almost dismiss them all. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I need something, I go looking for it. And then that gets us to number four, the fact that it's all digitized means if I work in that order or the reverse order where I see notifications and that tells me what to do, but either way, the fact that it's digitally available in a single workspace uh, gives me the ability to go find it instead of, uh, you know, flipping through papers on my desk. Right. And I would make the argument also that even if you're, if you do happen to be overloaded by being notified about what's going on, um, the fact that 
you don't have to call a special meeting to review all of the data when you do determine that it's something you want to investigate and it's already there for you. That alone is a game changing experience. Right. And so, uh, it's, it, I mean, even in your personal life, right. Uh, in my life, what I've noticed over time is that what used to be text messaging used to be me and my close friends and family. But now what's happened is, is that text messaging has almost become, or it has become like the priority inbox. So emails, push notifications, whatever it is, phone calls, even people can be blown up your phone. But if a text message comes in, that's probably what you're going to look at first. And that's how someone can get your attention. And that's how you can immediately prioritize things. And mm -hmm. so even in our regular life, right, we're, we're balancing that, right, of, of overload of information, prioritizing the information and reacting to it appropriately, right? And, and it's going to be a constant evolution. I don't think it will we'll always get better, but there will always be room for improvement. So I, I love that example, um, but I do think we have um, a challenge at the moment. And I'll use your personal example of text messaging. Eric, if I were, if I were to get a, a, a hold of you, um, would the best way be a text message or a phone call at this point? Which one is A and which one is B and you, for you at this moment? Uh, a text message is better. Okay. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll tell you because a phone call interrupts what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And I can look at a text message and see at least high level context of what it is that you, you would need. And whereas I'm more inclined to dismiss a phone call, even yeah. though psychologically it probably doesn't make sense because if you're getting called, it must be really important. But mm -hmm. the thing is, is that like, if I'm already on, like if I'm, I'm doing a podcast, if somebody was to text, text me right now and they said, Eric, this is super urgent. I could say, all right, hey, I need to pause this. Let's go. Let me, I need to help somebody, right? But mm -hmm. if I'm getting a phone call, I'm just going to let it go to voicemail. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's just how it is now. Now, what if you got a phone call that you screened and a text message immediately from that person? Is that the true, um, is that the true, you know, red flag? Yeah, definitely. And I mean, there's already a prioritization in my own mental state of who I pay attention to more, right? It's very mm -hmm. similar to what we do with, uh, prioritizing what alerts that you're getting right in your business. But my wife, <laughs> if I'm getting a call or a text message from her, no matter what I'm doing, I'm immediately going to pay attention to that. Um, and, and, you know, she understands that she has that priority too. So when she does call me or reach out to me, when she knows that I'm doing something like this or otherwise, she mm -hmm. knows that it's going to carry a certain amount of weight too. Right. And other people in my life or other people that I work with also have different levels of priority too. So I get a call, I get a text message, or, you know, I know my phone automatically has a, a mode where in do not disturb mode, if I get called three times from the same number, it's going to break through the do not disturb. So, you know, it's the same thing, right? Like it repeated and multiple ways of getting notified is going to automatically prioritize things and break you out of whatever it is that you're doing. Yeah. yeah, that that's interesting. A couple things. Um, so my wife and I have an agreement that if she calls twice, it must be important. Uh, the other day, I got uh, two phone calls and an immediate text, and she needed me to stop and pick up milk on the way home. <laughs> now, well, criti critical uh, prioritization is different for uh, different people, I guess. Well, where that becomes interesting is she knows bang, bang, and then bang again, she's going to get my attention uh, and get her immediate result right then. Um, at the same time, I'm now to the point where when people want to solicit me for something, they know to call me two times in a row with the assumption that it must be urgent if they call twice, answer the phone. And today I had two phone calls and an immediate text from the person and they were just cold calling me. Like right. at what, at what point, like, how do we fix that at some point? Like you said, three calls. Well, at some point they're going to be calling you three times because they know that's going to break through your system. Uh, my, my point in bringing that up is number four here, the digitized your program that allows me to, um, to get three phone calls and a text message from somebody. And then I go to LinkedIn and look them up. I'm like, Oh, wait a minute. That's just somebody trying to sell me something. So I get to take the data because it's digitized. Yep. Uh, and I get to make my own decisions around whether it was urgent or not. 
That's right. That's true. And it's, it's about providing you with the appropriate information to make a appropriate decision. And right. whether that's in responding to an alert or someone reaching out to you or creating an action based on something that you've consulted with someone else with, right? It, it's about having having that. And as I just said, it's a it's going to be a constant evolution where as close as we are to the end goal, there's going to be that much more that we can improve. And, and I think the age old uh, component is it's the 80, 20 rule, right? You, you want to have 80% of that on lockdown, which is probably the wrong word to use in this day and age, but, uh, you know, have that protocol established so it can encompass the majority of interactions and pro priorities that you have. And then, um, the rest of it will have to be continually worked on. And, but that's, that's the thing going, pulling it back to service now and digitizing things in your organization, right? Once you're at that level, you've digitized the protocol and the parameters and you have people collaborating from anywhere with work that goes from one place to the other. And you have the business owners and the leaders viewing what's going on. When you want to make a change, you can do it. It's mm -hmm. not, a whole big assessment to say, oh, we have to review how did this all happen and what do we do to change? Because not only is changing it easier, but changing it again is even easier, right? And so the, the, the change is less painful, which makes it better to do. Whereas for the longest time, and to call back to the beginning of our conversation where I was talking about some other companies that are large established legacy organizations, what I would say, they change is evil to them. And for right, for the appropriate reasons, it would cost so much time and effort to make a, something different that you like, you basically have to know where you're going before you go there. And it doesn't matter if you're wrong, you have to continue on that path because even to take two steps back, it's the pain. And we're just, we're at a point where that's that's not the case most of the time anymore. You have the ability to digitize your organization, your business processes, your crisis response, and be prepared. So when you do need to make an additional change, that improvement in efficiency, productivity, resilience, whatever it may be, it's at your fingertips. I'll use your 80-20 uh, comment. It's really probably more like 90-10. ServiceNow gives you the ability to focus on the, the, the real 10 that matter, even out of the 20, um, while it's still seeing the entire playing field, which is the 100%. Um, and if you need to evolve around that, it's a, a platform that's going to allow you to do that without having to start from scratch. I had a, when I started my company, there was a guy who said to me, uh, hey, I can't. I'm going to need x86 apps forever. Um, because I can't rewrite my application. I could, but the cost of doing it would be more than I'd ever make back up. Uh, having a platform that gives you a place to start um, significantly lowers that cost and time to market. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and it's, it's taking those considerations into thought about how you move forward is what's important, right? And um, if you don't think about it, uh, it's going to, it's going to happen regardless. Right. That same guy has now moved everything to SaaS based app. It took him a decade to finally come around to doing it, but he, you know, he wasn't planning on selling his product. He couldn't sell his product. It was legacy. Um, right. And by sell it, I mean, sell the company to somebody who wanted it. Um, so he's you know now come full circle. It took time and money and effort, but it was inevitable. Yeah. And, and you know, I'm, I'm very excited to see, uh, where things go from here, uh, not just in dealing with crisis response, but in, in digital transformation in general. Um, but the, the journey is never over. Uh, and like we, we have, have it here in the, at the end of the blog post, we're talking about how even ServiceNow is migrating to our, the newest version of our business continuity app in Q3 of this year. And so the journey is constant and, uh, it's constantly being tweaked and modified and updated. And um, uh, that is, it's just part of, of doing business now. It, you need to have that 
you need to build your business. Like you said, you, uh, uh, Zentegra was born at a point where you had this capability to be healthy work-life balance and not be held to a single location and all of that stuff, right? You can now take that as the foundation and make tweaks uh, along the way, maybe swap a couple pieces out, et cetera. But mm -hmm. that, that ship is built and now you can keep moving. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Eric, thanks for the time. Um, I uh, always appreciate these conversations and, and we'll continue doing them. Uh, anything else uh, outside of the context of the blog here that you'd want to share with our listeners? Um, I would say that uh, I, something relevant that's um, to this conversation at a bigger scale is uh, our um, chief customer and partner officer. Uh, her name is Laura. Uh, she did an interview for Tech Republic and um, it talks at a much higher level from a much different pay grade than myself am in. Uh, she runs a very big part of our organization and she talks a lot about not specifically BCM uh, as a solution, but uh, just our organization and how we are approaching the reality that we exist in now. And I think it would be a great, uh, great read from a great executive and some great perspective on what we've been talking about. So um, you, can you know, what I think so interesting about that is how many employees are you guys now? To be honest, I would, I don't know. I would probably call it th 10, I don't know, 8,000, 10,000. It's something like that. Now it's, it's, we've been growing so fast that I can't keep track of it anymore. My, my point in bringing that up is whether you're 8,000 or eight, or let's say 80, um, a lot of the same logic and needs apply. That, that's what's so interesting about today's world is I uh, got a call from a car dealership earlier today that's been hit with ransomware. The, the answer to fix them would be the same answer it would be to fix Ford. It's very right. Similar. Yep. And, uh, and I will tell you that the, um, the way that the fact that we are in a position where a solution is not only limited to a massive organization with massive uh, pockets, you know, deep pockets is unbelievable, right? And that 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 means that um, anybody, just about anybody, and any organization can do things in a very similar way. Uh, so the scale and availability of solutions from business continuity, digital transformation, solving problems with ransomware, uh, et cetera. Uh, the, it, it's amazing what's available to people and what they can do if they just want to do it. Yeah, you have, you have big company problems, but you don't necessarily need a big company budget to solve it. Yep, yeah. And that, that's probably, to be honest, that's probably my, the most exciting thing for me personally about technology in general is mm -hmm. how the evolution of technology and its availability continues to improve people's lives. And we could have a whole podcast all about that. I mean, if you look at, I'm a, I'm an Apple user. I have an Apple watch, uh, the like health capability that this has and has on the horizon is amazing. And I'm a big sci-fi fan. You talk about Star Trek and their like medical tricorder and what they've been able to, to portray as the future. Uh, in hundreds of years from now, I mean, it's amazing what technology is allowing somebody without the resources to do to make decisions about their health, their life, their business, et cetera. So it's an exciting time to be here. It is. Yeah. And technology is a huge enabler, or a huge enabler of all of it. Well, Eric, I'll, I'll let you go. I appreciate you joining and uh, we'll do this again in a couple, couple weeks. Yep. Great conversation. Appreciate it. Thanks.